Is Jarv not coming? I think he is out of office today. Oh, I was unaware of this. Which cat is this one? That's one of the bubble. Okay. Zuko is usually the one that no one ever sees, but. But he is interested in the main room migration, so it's here. <laughs> sure, we'll go with that. <laughs> All right, uh, shall we kick start? Yeah, let's get started. Um, I don't really have too much to show for. So I think what I'm going to show, I'll share my screen so you're not looking at a cat butt. Uh, share screen and let's make it smaller because that's irrational. Um, so Jarb did the most, uh, most of the work to initially implement um, Mailroom so far inside of Kubernetes. So, so far, the only thing we've got, we need to go. We're following the same pattern that we did for the Kubernetes registry. So in this case, inside of each of our environment files, we're starting to add the necessary in, uh, items to enable Mailroom. So here in this case, we simply set Mailroom enable true, and we set the specific version of the tag that we want. Um, we set the specific version because I think there were the image that we want in the default chart was not yet up to date with the latest version that we were shipping with the GitLab product at the time. But I think we can remove this now. Um, yeah, I'm pretty sure we could just remove this now. And aside from that, there's not really too much. Um, there's a, if we go back to our values and we search for mail or uh, incoming mail, we have the basics that stay the same for all of our environments. So we're using GMO for everything. We're setting the port. You know, this is just the configuration. Um, we're creating a secret called GitLab Mailroom IMAP as a secret object inside of Kubernetes. And then we've got a key called password that will fill in the necessary stuff. Not sure why user is blank. Maybe I didn't ask Jarvis about that. Maybe it's just not there. Maybe there's no user for the authentication method. I don't know. Um, and this mimics our configuration that's across our omnibus installation. So theoretically, mail works in pre. I've not tested it myself. I've seen Jarb test it multiple times and it works just fine. Same for staging. Um, we had to go through a little snafu of disabling everyone else's email because that was a production database import at some point in time. Um, but that works as well. Um, so if we go to our ops instance. We should see fun things in our environments. Oh darn, I didn't want to click a button. Oh, we only see the registry, why is that? Interesting. Maybe we are missing the labels for the for the monitoring to pick up the new new pods. Yeah. And that's just an annotation cha change. I thought the work that we did for that was um, was uh, global. Um, but if we um, I just want to make sure we actually do have pot, the mailroom pod. Yeah, the mailroom pod is running. Okay. Um, Can we logging wise, the annotation just to see if there is a difference. Uh, 
Oh, darn. Yeah, it's completely missing. It's their label up mail room. It should be the, the thing that we need. Can we just check the registry? Maybe there are other labels and we are missing them. Why are you purple all of a sudden? These are the two that we need and they're missing. So there must be something inside of, there must be something we did not do globally, unfortunately. Okay, I'll create an issue to address that. Um, as far as logging goes, that is that should be in place, but I don't know how to show that to you because we don't really, get logs at a mailroom um it doesn't log anything like we'll get a message saying the pod starts and that's pretty much it uh get lab mailroom yeah that's it and that was probably from weeks ago when the pod started two days ago so theoretically i should be able to find that in our logs um, question is, I know that you logged or linked to an issue that uh, mentions something like in the original uh, Mailroom Jam, there is a report that we should be logging something, right? Do we have some the same issue at our issue tracker? I'm sorry, say that last part again. Uh, do we have an issue in our own issue tracker that um, shows that we don't have any logs or that it highlights that we don't have any logs for our mailroom? We only have an issue that is geared towards um, the configuration of uh, structured logging uh, when that gets implemented inside of GitLab, and that is still a work in progress. So that's uh, like the general logging Part. Correct. We don't have Correct. the specific service part. All right. So we need an issue inside of GitLab. In GitLab. The infrastructure tracker or the, the delivery tracker. No, application. So this is inside of application itself. Application is not logging anything. Oh, so yeah, that's correct. Yeah. We can then reference that GitHub issue in the mailroom gem. And then we can maybe even put some priority on that, depending on how much we care to see the logs, actually. I don't even know if the mailroom gem logs anything. Well, the version that we're not. using, I don't know if it logs anything. It does not. So I think, yeah, there's an open issue right now in GitLab that someone is assigned to where they're trying to add the structured logging because that was a new implementation. So they're going to try to upgrade the mailroom gem that's being utilized. And then once that gets upgraded, we should be able to do the necessary stuff inside of the infrastructure work to uh, grab that actual log data. All right, can uh, I uh, ask the question again? Someone is working on the structured logging, right? Yes, to upgrade but the mailroom. Specifically for mailroom or in general? Specifically for mailroom. All right. I think to once you can that needs to be inside of like the omnibus package. Right. All right. So after the demo, please link in the in the Google Doc that issue. Yeah. Uh, under number two bullet point issue it'll be to highlight. Um Okay. As far as metrics go, I have nothing to show for. I've got an, a merge request in for metrics. Um, so I've built two things, uh, mailroom. 
application info and pod info, and both of these should work today. Um, so inside of prod, because we don't have any pods that are running inside of Kubernetes, we don't have anything from Stack Driver from Mailroom, but we do have our unread email accounts. Um, and this is something we've always had a metric for, we just never had a dashboard for, so this is something new. Um, and then recently, we added this. There's no data in production, obviously, but at least in staging, we'll have some data for our pod. So we do have visibility into things, and we have existing alerts. The only alert that we have for the application side of things is when we cross the threshold of over 25 unread emails. Um, That's the only thing we have for the application itself. And then we also have our standard pod notifications. So if a pod fails after a period of time, we'll get an alert for it, or if it's crash looping, or if the replica set wants a certain number and we're not meeting that replica set count, we'll get an alert for it. Um, and this is just due to the fact that we don't really have good visibility from the mailroom gem. There's an open issue that I created to add a Prometheus scraping endpoint to the mailroom gem. The maintainer's like, uh, that's a little much, but you know, it's probably something we could contribute if we want to go down that route. I'm not really sure what else to show at this moment in time. Run me through um how we right now if the state remains like this and we decide to move to production run me through what kind of changes we need to do uh to change the versions and deploy or rather let me rephrase that run me through an upgrade process you still see my shell correct yes So an upgrade process, I'll use pre as an example. Um, be primary pre. Uh, here we would just, you know, do the same exact thing we've done in the registry in the past. Uh, we would create a commit for this. I'll accept those changes. should see my browser correct yes and of course you know this is the same process we did for the registry so we'd set our tag um, the ops instance is where that is important because that's the one that runs the actual CI for all this stuff dry one we should see our diff that we're changing the image that we're being that's being utilized as seen here and if you'd like I could go through and approve and merge this and then we could wait five minutes for it to actually apply not necessary yeah this, so um, right now the process is precisely the same yeah okay uh, How do we, how can we, so imagine that discussion that we have in, in the issue with the distribution team where I'm asking, can we remove the tight coupling between charts and the images and have them a bit looser so that um, we are a bit more free to, to do deploy quicker. Imagine we have that. Imagine we, we decided to do that. 
Is there any other way apart from just saying that the tag is latest or that the tag is like latest table or something like that to roll out things without committing everything individually? And for the record, I, I mean, then for the record, drop. and for the record, I hate latest and I hate anything that is a loose tag because it creates a lot of problems. But I want to discuss here what kind of options we have. Because what do we want to do? We want to not only like roll, migrate all of these things to Kubernetes, right? We want to tie this into the existing process so that it's one on one. Um, it's one on one process, basically. It's the same between different components. Um, and that we don't revert back to the old behaviors of we are waiting for a tagged release to be able to run to GitLab.com because that is exactly where we don't want to end up on. Right now, what we end up doing is we have commit SHAs basically being our tags. Yeah. And we don't have latest <laughs> on we that. Don't want so I would to use latest. And That's we don't want to use the latest. Yeah. That's also frowned upon in Kubernetes land. I don't Not know. Really. Have you this... have you checked have you checked a bunch of charts? All of them are using latest for stuff. So. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, yes. This was a problem that I needed to solve at my last job, and I didn't know how to do it without creating an inconsistency between what is actively running and what we configure without doing a commit. Mm -hmm. um, so it was an unsolved problem for my last job. So I don't know how to solve that today unless we inject somewhere else the version that we want to use. And then when we perform deploys, it does like a lookup to some service to determine what version it wants to pull down when it templates out that YAML and applies yeah. it to the server. This is something you can do, but then you have to build auditing around this because you want to know who and why changing yeah. something. I was also thinking that last year I was briefly involved with the Binauf, I think is his name, is the um, hardening of Kubernetes cluster. I'm not sure if, yeah, it's kind of a Google thing, but it's based on some open standards. And they have this kind of problem because you can only run authorized images on your cluster. So in that case, it's even worse because not only you have to always use the the, the SHA or the commit, but the SHA of the, Im, of the image itself, but you also have to notarize and upload inside the cluster that the image is allowed to run. So we may end up building another system that handle this for us if we don't want to use git commit, but there's a state that has to be saved somewhere now. I set up my trap and I want to say some outrageous things. Um, in this call. And the two of you are responsible for everything that comes out of it. Um, <laughs> no pressure. <laughs> Alessio, fully agree with you. We need to build that type of system for sure at some point. Uh, we are going that way and um, I don't see a way around it. Like there, li literally there is no way around it. However, we are so far away from it right now that investing in a system that we don't even know how it can look makes a little sense little sense to me what i've been thinking is a tiny bit more iterative approach which is kind of controversial but we can leverage rci and when I say leverage, I mean abuse, which means that theoretically we can commit um, inside of our um, values YAML that we are using a CI variable name, CI variable name mailroom underscore conversion, something like that. 
And then every time we want to actually deploy something, we can um, automatically update our CI variable in ops, for example, to the latest commit SHA that we want, either automatically or manually, which would mean that instead of us triggering this pipeline manually, we could do this inside of ops, inside of the Kubernetes GitLab com workloads, we could have a schedule that checks, runs a diff, and then if everything is okay, just rolls it out, but then commit somewhere as an audit trail, I have deployed X, Y, and Z. So basically, consider this something like a gem, gem file dot lock file after the fact we ran update. Like the same way you run bundle, is in, uh, bundle install, it updates the, the, the log file and exactly tells you what is currently in the, in the deployment. And when that happens, you have a full audit trail of what is currently running. And if you need to actually change something manually, you update the version inside of the CI variable Yep. And then the same process goes on. Gem file, I'm sorry, gem file. GitLab lock gets updated. Um, so you are back in the consistent state. Uh, what? So many problems with this. But what that also allows us to do is at any point in time, we can switch around and say that GitLab.lock is the source of truth. Yep. And any external system that needs to um, vet any changes can actually change that file and then trigger the rest of the system deployments automatically without actually having to change the whole system um, of deployment. Question time. So this is a file and is committed somewhere, okay? Mm -hmm. So we have a kind of master repo that has all the connecting yep. parts and that's your version also. Why, why do we need CI variables? Can we use directly Kubernetes secret? Uh, and in the CI of that repo, we transfer the information that is written in repo in uh, Kubernetes secrets, whatever, and then we can just mount them as hash map or whatever inside when we want. We can also build, so it can be an ATCD, so we can access it from the machine, or we can even build a very simple demons that run inside our system where people can dynamically query and ask what's the version of this or that. So, I mean, I don't want to go too far into it, but the point is, is it's an option. variables can happen without leaving tracks of it, which is things that scares me a bit. In, instead, if we, the as in, as, we as in you mean uh, changing variables in CI can leave, uh, you don't have the audit log of who changed and what did they change it to. That's what you're trying to say inside of yeah. CI. And I'm quite sure, but I'm not, not completely sure. There is no CI audit. Uh, there is no audit. I'm, I'll, tell, okay. I'll tell you right now. Um, number one, yes, that is possible. My counter question to you would be, does that mean that we are circumventing GitLab as a source of truth of deployments? No, I mean that the git the, the file is in gitlab gitlab runs the ci the ci write the config maps and kubernetes so the source of truth the origin of the data is gitlab itself what is provided by the cluster so it's inside the cluster so you change the yeah go ahead. who changes the version who changes the the sha of whatever version we want to deploy it's the this, this famous log file. So once you commit, ah, you mean okay. So we still have that in this okay, in one okay, place, only one, yep. and then it goes. Possible, sure. Doesn't have to be a CI variable. I was using the most boring solution I could think of, because we have that. We don't have to write any code for it. We know how to use it, and that is literally the stupidest idea you can have. To do it and I'm really good at those and stupid ideas. So sure it's an option but what I'm trying to suggest here is that this can actually get us there much quicker to buy us time 
to be able to build something more robust, uh, as you're suggesting. Alternative to that, building your own, uh, the, the thing you suggested, is why not add freaking audit logging <laughs> to CI variables and have everyone benefit from it, right? That would be even better because then we don't have a custom piece of stuff to, to maintain. Yeah, sure, makes sense. I feel like this is better handled if we had a some sort of GitLab operator that handled the GitLab install. Uh -huh. Yes, absolutely. Um, will you knock at the distribution's door to ask them uh, how far off are they from uh, finishing that? Because when I left the team, that was still not done. The problem I have with both of the proposed solutions is that if you're doing a brand new install for the first time, that system that looks up what to install is not going to be there. Like that CI variable might be there and that's fine, but the YAML that we use to configure all of our instances is still gonna have a potentially old version that is discrepant of what we want to be installed. Mm -hmm. So I don't know how to work around that particular problem and that's gonna be problematic for any new installation, which I guess doesn't happen often. So, Step but in a, that would be, in a disaster scenario, that's a huge problem. Absolutely. So that means that when you're doing some changes to this, this is the, the, the second question you need to ask. Like, how do we make sure that we implement this while being able to uh, start from scratch? Whether that means every time you need to update uh, or create a new environment, you need to depend on an existing file of some sort, like staging or something like that. Or again, even dumber solution would be, if the file exists, do this. If not, generic template that has a skeleton yeah. and no values. So that's solvable as well. Unless you prefer your idea to mine. The more I think of it, the more the more it makes things easier to manage, uh, easier to follow, and it leaves a trace behind better. The only downside is it's it's a completely new thing. The, that's the only problem I have with it. Yeah, the, uh, we should think if we can avoid writing any kind of say code around it and just leverage config maps directly. But I mean, we are far away from this, as you say, so it's just kind of tentative solution. But we don't even know by <coughs> details of the problem, so. Exactly. So, but would something like this be acceptable to, to both of you to, to try out? So let's say the goal is maybe not next week, obviously, but the goal is in a month from now, we want to see uh, mailroom deployments being automatically done by changing a value in CI variables. Instead of a YAML file. Instead of a I YAML I think that's file. a great solution. Um, I guess the only concern I have is that right now, our process of changing this value in the YAML file provides us a CI pipeline. We don't currently do this, but we could inject QA testing. If we did this outside of that process, I don't know off the top of my head how, how, we, would, how we would do that. Yeah. Can, can you explain again what's the problem? Well, like right now, um, I'll share my browser again. Um, Go away. We have the capability to get a pipeline when we make a change to that variable. Like right now, all we do is a dry run. So we just determine whether or not, you know, we can make this change. But theoretically, off of this could be a QA that spun up uh, and tested that new version prior to running a deploy on some fake environment or something. Um, the solution that you proposed, I'm not really sure how to do that. Yeah, but remove my solution. Just think about what uh, Marin suggested. Okay, so the, I think that the easiest thing here is that we can build the YAML file 
with let's say a very simple Ruby script and air, an ARB template so that we inject the values from the environment variables. We can still, I mean, the, the thing was Helm, I'm, I'm not sure, but I think the output was Helm. So we can still ask Helm to do the dry run. Yeah. And he will tell us if something changed or not. So we don't need to backtrack the value in CI because Helm will tell us if what we are trying to do changes from the status. Gotcha. And then we can do the next step. So if this happened, trigger something that do the QA. If not, don't do the QA. So the, 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 the most boring thing is just replacing all the input files the, it, we have, that you are writing and committing with a Ruby script and a template that just put variables there. Yeah. And this could even make, be made simpler. We just remove um, that value from the YAML template and we could just set that as a um, one of the set commands being piped into Helm when it runs. Possible, yeah. There's a it couple ways. It makes things a bit up. less. It makes things less um, clear, though. Declarative, yeah. Yeah, because you'd if have nothing to remember else, where that command is. If nothing else, with the YAML file, you go and see this weird variable, and you get to wonder where is this from, and then you look into documentation, which we will write, obviously, yeah. uh, and you find it. And further, even more than uh, than that, like you can just easily set. Uh, environmental variable in your environment when you're testing things easier than always remembering to do this this set so it's a bit more declarative uh okay. i can create an issue to address this um i'm i'm super curious to hear whether uh, this can even work uh, theoretically it should, there is no reason why not but there is still enough of edge cases that I can think of, like right this very moment, um, to to address. But it it could move us in the direction of not having to depend on images being so tightly coupled with uh, the Helm chart. And then that brings me to the Helm chart. Um, I understand the discomfort that. Um, distribution team has with running charts from master. Um, I checked the charts the other day and they're getting like yeah, decent enough of new issues, decent enough of um, I'm choosing my words things that still need to be over, overcame, overcome compared to Omnibus, which has been tried and tested and is rock solid. So we are deploying from master basically um, right now, but Omnibus is, is sees so many eyes uh, that I understand it. But theoretically, what we could do is say that we are not pulling from a tagged version of a chart, but there we can say that we are pulling from the latest stable branch of the charts. That would allow them to backport fixes as soon as they need, they need it. We would be able to not depend on them tagging, tagging a version um, and we would be able to leverage um, Helm updates as well. The only mm -hmm. concern, well, not the only, a lot of concerns, but one of the concerns I have there is how do you ensure that you roll out Helm ch changes independently from image changes. So they not, don't step over each other because you want to have the smallest delta as possible for any change that you do. So say if we have a scheduled pipeline that will continuously um, upgrade, we want to ensure that it always only catches one type or the other. So yeah. Helm, pulling the changes in the Helm chart should be a blocking thing for any other changes uh, yeah. on images, for example. But that could be like a way forward for us to do uh, this. So as far as you can see here, I'm trying to find a way where we are going to be the observers of the process rather than uh, people responsible for git commit this version. Like I don't want to go back to manual work. 
And I know for a fact that a lot of smaller companies, medium companies actually do this because that's the safest thing to do. It is safest thing to do, but it's not the nicest thing to do because you depend on, on, on humans. Um, and that would also push us in the direction of depending more on uh, tests, depending more on alerts, depending more on that. If something happens, block the deployments, explode, right? Like yell yeah. somewhere rather than uh, everything is quiet and then you commit something, deploy, and then everything explodes. And that's not what we want to do. So that's, that's something to think about as well. For now, I would be happy to just put the goal of in one month, we want to see the progression of Mailroom independently from us committing into the values file. Makes sense. And then, and then we can like set the next goal. And this is also one of the reasons why I was pushing us towards the direction of, of Mailroom at this moment. Uh, because that would allow us to do the next thing much quicker. Yeah. All that and other things, mostly JAR being persistent. <laughs> cool. Okay. Um, I got enough from, uh, from this demo and I hope you did uh, as well. Do we have still a bit of time or oh, because I didn't, I didn't remember the schedule. I had some r random question related and related to this that maybe we can just quickly discuss. Um, should I stop the recording then or? No, no, it's okay. okay. <laughs> Go for it. I mean, we have the AMA in 20 minutes, but that's oh, yeah, about 20 minutes, right. So yeah. uh, first directly to, to, to the main room thing, this is something that I'm, I'm not really extremely familiar with. So my question here is, how can we use, because what I understood is main room reads from EMAP and publish to Sidekick. Okay, so this is, or is it, it's consuming email. So how do we deploy this? We have just one, more than one. How can we ensure that we can run the Kubernetes version plus the old VM together or just one single thing and can you can't run two of them together? Mailroom has a feature, they call it arbitration, where it talks to Redis and creates a, like a, a unique ID and a lock for who's going to process the email. So we could run the VMs in parallel with um, the ones in Kubernetes, no problem. We already do this with multiple VMs today. So this will be a quick and easy way to test things, to validate that the pods are running like they're supposed to, and then we could just shut down the VMs when we're ready. Okay, so this was easy enough. Done. Yeah, this is a feature that I think Dawa and um, someone else inside of GitLab developed for the Memorum Gem. Okay, perfect. Now, the other one is more general to our Kubernetes workloads and is kind of a, a provoking idea. So, I was looking at this uh, kind of, uh, it's called fork and, fork and slash. When it's something you have a monolith and you want to kind of enforce uh, ownership of part of it in terms of error budget things and things like that. So what if in Kubernetes we do, once we move to Kubernetes, we do a mapping of endpoints and assign them to the, the product team that owns that part of the code base. And then an HA proxy we route only to several pods so we can scale independently by set of feature and we kind of have free error budgeting. It doesn't, is not really complete because let's say then you go through Gitaly call and you can do this later on, but it's still the entry point kind of identifies uh, which product category owns it. So let's say it's a CI thing then goes for the verify. So everything that is less CI goes to a, 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 a service deployment. So it's a set of bots that are supposed to only handle a CI API requests. Same for uh, web, I don't know, web IDE or the, whatever. We, we can do the split as much as we want. So that, um, it's a lot of work, okay. But then we can tag the, the monitoring and the error rates and everything by the family of the bot. And then we know which team 
deflated his own budget. And we can do the same for Sidekick and go on and go on and go on. The idea behind this is that he, they do the same thing I also said, now you're going to really fork the project. You can remove the code that just doesn't belong to you, but no, we, I don't want to go in that direction. So the idea is that you still deploy everything to everyone, but you only route to the, the code that teams owns. And this could be a good way for, let's say, measuring um, the features that we are using, how many resources they can consume. So maybe we can end up scaling uh, CI, more pod for CI, less pod for package management or whatever. And we can have better understanding of what we are doing and who's doing good and who's doing not good. So you're suggesting that we take error budgeting or the just general metrics for a specific team and route that or make that the deciding factor for how traffic is routed for a particular feature to a set of backend pods. Yeah, each team has his front end pods, his back end pod, whatever we can rebuild. Yeah. But the only things related to that team goes to that pod. So that you you can count the errors, the 500s, whatever, and this you have a certain point. I mean, maybe then you realize in the stack trace that it's the problem is in another area of the code base. It's, it's okay, it's fine. But you have a, a, a let's say a tier one ownership for the problem, or whatever, not an alpha aging bug or whatever it is. That's an interesting take on a different method of implementing microservices. I kind of like that uh, concept. Um, there, that would put a lot of pressure on the currently what is our HA proxy nodes to route traffic to the appropriate place. We've always wanted to replace HA proxy with something different. So that might be a good opportunity to take that into effect whenever we get around to looking at that again. That's interesting. Alessio, you sold me right now. I want it built yesterday. I already said it in the scalability uh, channel. I need that stuff uh, two years ago. Um, I wouldn't be opposed into doing some POCing there. First of all, like finding who actually owns reply by email because categories page, product categories page does not even list this doesn't list mailroom, doesn't list incoming email, doesn't list reply by email. So I don't know who owns so this. The service desk feature. Service desk? Yeah. That might be. Certified group. We don't even, I didn't even know we had certified group. Okay. I guess we have it. So do, do we, do we have someone hired in that group? <laughs> or is it like the old packages when it was no I mean, one? I mean, there are people listed there. So. And it says that the feature is viable, so. Okay, certify might be uh, the group. If you can write up a proposal and do like small POC um, with what we can do right now, I am more than happy to take this in parallel with us uh, liberating from a tagged version. So have it like run in parallel and by the end of the project, like we call the success of Mailroom when it's in production and when it's actually um, where we have a way of attributing um, things to, to different categories. And I wouldn't actually want to route it to a different team. Like I wouldn't want to have certified group or whatever else. I would prefer if we do this per feature name because teams, you know how fast teams change here. So, uh, makes no sense. This is what we did with Sidekick Attribution in uh, in Scalability, right? Like we mapped it to features rather than teams, and then it's easy to always connect yeah, features team with the team. The feature, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, interesting. Con I I like the idea. Interesting concept. So um, if you need some time to to do that, uh, more than happy to chat with you to to see how we can clear up the time to to get that investigated. Okay, I'll think about it, write something down, and then we can. Yep. Cool. Um, shall we end it here then? 
Sure. Sure. Awesome. Scarbeck, uh, see, there was something to demo. There is always something to demo and uh, a lot of uh, things came out of it. So, um, what do we want to set as a, as a goal for next week? Um, I can try building a POC based on composing the, the YAML file with the, with the variable. I don't think it's really hard to do. It's just a matter of running a script before what we already have. So let's take this as a goal. Yeah, I'm, I'm open for that. I didn't want to be the one suggesting it because it would seem too much pressure. All right, let's set it that way. And then if we don't reach it, we don't reach it, right? Like, but we are going to try and uh, get these things done. Um, and see what, uh, let's see what also Jar thinks about all of this, so. Okay. Cool. See you in a bit. Thank you, everyone.